But what has become the standard line, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Here's my question to you. What if the sinner loves his sin? What if the sinner loves his sin? Does God's love extend to sinners who love their sin? Well, it certainly extended to me when I loved my sin. And so there is that reality. But you see, the only way to make that work is to recognize that God's love must be differentiated. The idea that there was an equal, undifferentiable love, operational at the Red Sea. Let's go ahead and use that. I used it as an illustration before. It's a good enough illustration. There's many other other illustrations we could use. We could make we could make uh, application to, and I'll, I'll try to remember to make application to say the people standing at the foot of the cross. Uh, many incidences in 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 the history of Israel. But let's look at the Red Sea for now. The love of God. Is it true or is it untrue that God could have brought judgment to bear upon every single human being involved in the incident at the shore of the Red Sea? The Pharaoh's army is closing in on the on the Israelites. They're trapped against the sea. Moses parts the sea by God's power. They walk across, and then the Egyptians try to cross, and the sea covers them, and they are killed. Now, before they enter in to the Red Sea, was there any person standing anywhere near the Red Sea that was not under the just judgment of God? Any non-sinners? Perfect people? Individuals who are not a stench in the nose of a holy God? If you think there were, I invite you simply to look into your own heart. How many lustful thoughts? How many dishonest thoughts? How many thoughts... And you go, but, but, but God made us that way. See, you, you, you're not even operating in a Christian worldview when you think that way. Not even operating in a biblical realm when you think that way. You have no concept of the purity and holiness of God. None. God's wrath could have come on any person. That means that God was restraining his wrath. There was what we call common grace being extended to everybody in that God had not brought his wrath to bear. Upon those individuals, he was restraining that wrath. God's love was being shown in that they had all, up to that point in time, had at least enough health to get them to that point. They had had food. They had had sunshine. Grace had been extended in that sense. But again, you have to differentiate between saving grace and common grace, redeeming love, and that love which is seen in God's taking care of his own creation. And so... At the end of that incident, there's only a certain number of people that are still alive. And there's a bunch of people that are dead. Are you going to tell me that God's love was equal for those two groups? The only way to even begin to make sense of this is to recognize that just as we differentiate in our expression of love, just as we are to love God supremely, even above our human families, so too God has love that is differentiated. And that is not a defect. That is an aspect of personhood. And so with that in mind, Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals in the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be a portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Is that merely poetry? Is that not foundational to an understanding of God's law? Is that not foundational to even understanding of why the cross had to happen? Doesn't that explain why it is that we only have eternal life and forgiveness in Jesus Christ? If it was true that there was something lovable about us outside of Christ, then why do we need Christ? Listen to it again. Yahweh, literally, Yahweh tests the righteous. Is that just a, is that just a poetic statement? Is that just, well, it's just poetry. It's just the Psalms. Um, wow, how many times does the New Testament quote from the Psalms in the middle of, well, you know, Romans 4. Blessed is the man. Talking about justification. Ah, it's just, it's just poetry. Just poetry. Romans, uh, 
Romans 3, the sinfulness of man. <laughs> poetry. Poetry. It's ad- <laughs> don't have to don't worry about that. Just poetry. Does Yahweh test the righteous? Sure, sure does. That's a, that is a theologically true statement. Think of how many times the Lord has tested you as a believer. Brought you into trials and difficulties. To change you, grow you, mature you. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Yeah, but, but, but my preacher said, yeah, but, but the Psalter says. But, but if, but if he, but if he, if he, if he hates the wicked, what, what about the Bible saying that God so loved the world? What do you do? Try to, try to pit one against the other? How do you do biblical exegesis? And this is one of the things that really, really concerns me about what William Lane Craig said. Basically, he's going to take the viewpoint that you sort of count up the numbers. And if it's just a couple passages, then you just, they're, they are, they're done away with by the overwhelming number. I, I was shocked. In fact, let's just, let's go ahead and play it. Let's go ahead and play it. Let's, uh, let's listen to what he had to say, and then we'll interact with it. Um, Dr. Craig, I just wanted to check uh, where you come from with a God that um, loves sinners, and yet in the Bible it says multiple times he hates sinners. Not just hates sin, but does actually hate sinners, compared to the God of Islam where he does not love sinners. Where do you... Uh, uh-huh. I think that if you look at passages throughout the Bible, there are almost no passages in which it says that God hates sinners. There are a couple of poetic passages in the Psalms, but very, very few. And these are completely outweighed by the massive number of texts that affirm God's love for sinners, affirm his love for the world, and the whole plan of Christian salvation which is done on behalf of unbelievers. So the overwhelming evidence in the Bible is that God loves sinners and cares for them. And these other passages would be poetic or or non-literal and completely outweighed by these other passages. And as an open-minded person, I thought, could the same be the case with the Quran? Uh, Could it be that these are just poetic, poetic expressions of God's hatred of sin? The problem is that there's no place in the Quran, no outweighing texts that affirm that God does love sinners and unbelievers. The texts are unanimous that God is an enemy to unbelievers, that he doesn't love them, that he only loves those who love him and do righteous deeds, and then he will give them love. So the whole concept of the love of God in Islam and in Christianity, I think, is just radically different. In Christianity, God's love is unconditional, universal, uh, and unearned. Whereas in Islam, it is conditional, it is partial, and it needs to be earned. So. I say that not as a polemicist, but just as an honest exegete. I think there's just this world of difference between the two concepts. Now, I also think that there is a world of difference between the presentation of the Bible in regards to God's love and that of the Quran. I I do not see in any way, shape, or form that the author of the Quran understood the self-giving love of God that is found in the New Testament. There's no question about that. And even if you take the perspective that, well, the reason that God loves certain people is because he's predestined them to that, and therefore uh, they don't earn that, is totally different. Even if you take that that viewpoint as the Quranic viewpoint, and hence the idea, well, you don't earn this because, you know, God's the one who determines your actions, so it's not like you're earning it. God did these actions through you that result in this. Okay, I, I understand that particular perspective. It's not the only view expressed by Muslims, but, and and I don't know that the Quran is actually clear or consistent enough to make that kind of conclusion, but even if that were the case, the vast difference between Christianity and Islam at that point is that in Christianity, God personally, through a personal relationship by his spirit, raises the sinner to spiritual life by a power that is the extension of his own power, love, mercy, and grace. He places his spirit in that person, and he's able to engage in this personal communion with this sinful individual because he himself has provided the propitiation for the sins of that individual by entering into the time of the person of Jesus Christ. There is no concept of that in in Islam. There's no question about that. There is a vast difference between what the Quran teaches and what the Bible teaches on these topics. Agreed. But, but, if I had been asked that question, I would have answered in a completely different way than William Lane Craig did. I would not have dismissed Psalm 11.5. I would not have... Now, remember, 
right at the end there, I didn't make this up. Listen, listen to what he says. Not as a polemicist, but just as an honest exegete. He's identifying himself here as an exegete. So his exegetical analysis is that what Psalm 11.5 and texts like it say is, what was it, outweighed? It, it's, it's, it's outweighed by, by the, the large number of, of other texts. What, what did he, how do you put it? To the God of Islam where he does not love. Almost no passages in which it says that God hates sinners. There are a couple of poetic passages in the Psalms, but very, very few. And these are completely outweighed by the massive number of texts that affirm God's love for sinners, affirm his love for the world. Completely outweighed. So I thought that if you're an honest exegete, you do not take, well, a bunch of passages say this, therefore we will not harmonize these passages. We will conclude that they are contradictory, and therefore the ones that are contradictory, we will remove them from the realm of, of, of teaching, of containing theology, and we will relegate them to the realm of mere poetry and dismiss them in that way. Now, I realize that that is pretty common amongst our non-reformed friends. All you got to do is um, listen to Dave Hunt's repetitive argumentation that, well, it can't mean that because there are dozens of other texts that say this, my tradition, and they're in these texts over here. And then you go over those texts and you find out they don't say that, but there are, has to say that because there are dozens over here. That's, uh, that's not exegesis. That's defense of tradition. And in this case, uh, you have Dr. Craig really ripping the ground out from underneath, being able to present a full-orbed presentation of God. Now you've got a God who can love passionately, but he can't hate. Oh, but but, but God doesn't experience any of the... He's he's beyond what we realize we're not talking about in the human realm, but if God loves holiness, what must his attitude be towards him? Sort of corollary there, isn't it? And so you just dismiss them. Well, they're just poetic. Wow. John 14's poetic. Do we get rid of that? Some, some, the, the Carmen Christi is poetry in Philippians 2. Do we get rid of that? I mean, really. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And to say that this is done as an exegete. I am doing this on an exegetical level. Uh... Amazing. Now, of course, this wasn't a give and take. There's no one who's going to be able to, uh, you know, criticize him on that point. But if I was asked that question, A, I would not have given the same less than balanced criticism of the Quran's view of love in the first place. I would have probably focused more upon the concept of Qadr and contrasted Qadr in the Quran with that concept in the Bible and the fact that the real issue is that God has demonstrated his love toward us in the incarnation, which is the primary thing that Islam rejects, is the incarnation, which is why uh, we do debates on that particular subject. Um, I would have responded very differently, and I would have said, no, I do affirm that God hates sinners. That there is a sense in which God's love is universal, but it is not an undifferentiated love, and that, well, as Jesus himself said, right after John 3.16, he says to the one who does not believe what? The wrath of God abides upon him. You have to allow all the text to speak. You have to. You have to. If you don't let it all speak, you're not letting any of it speak. Think about that. If you do not allow all of Scripture to speak, you're not letting any of it speak. Because once you muzzle God in one area, 